So welcome to Sarah and George Choi Property Investing. Please subscribe to get next week's interview. And today I'm with my good friend, Mike Cruikshank on how to build a self-build house in the UK. Now let me tell you a little bit about Mike. So Mike's worked for over 45 years in construction and architecture sector. I'm sure looking at him, you'd never believe that. You'd think he's in his 20s. <laughs> yeah. Good here, George. <laughs> I got some too. <laughs> um, he's literally helped thousands of people to build their own homes. So that's amazing. Um, and for himself, you know, he's built two, built, two self-build properties for him and his, and his family. He's been involved in TV programs, including uh, My Flat Back Home, and DIY SOS. Um, he's also on an expert panel for home building and renovating magazines. So he's a very credible person in self-build world. Um, and uh, he has a, an online course, The Path to Self-Build Success. And I'll, I'll include a link uh, in the show notes where you can get, you can click on it and get to a free webinar. We can ask him loads of those questions after this. Um, so hi Mike, how are you doing? Uh, good morning, George. I'm doing fine, thank you. Yes, uh, from uh, not not so sunny Glasgow. It's actually heavy <laughs> rain and cloudy in Glasgow, I'm afraid. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. We have the sunshine. <laughs> Come down south, mate. Come down south. Um, the sunshine. The sun shines on the righteous, as they say, George. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got a got a couple of couple of questions just before we get down to the details of self build, and then. Uh, I've also got some questions which uh, my subscribers um, asked me to to ask on ask you, um, but uh, you know I'm, I'm definitely into education. I'm on a path of continual learning, growth. Um, so you know which which top books would you say have most influenced, changed, or transformed your life? I think uh, certainly uh, the first book I think that really had a major kind of light bulb moment in my head was uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. Um, and it's a book that I wish I had read in my teenage years rather than when I was in my 40s because I'm pretty sure that it would have transformed my life. But yeah. you're, as I say, you're never too late to learn. And, uh, you know, I really from that point on, that's when I decided to get involved with property property investment. So that was back in, back in 2007. So I would certainly strongly recommend to people for themselves and indeed for their children when they're old enough to kind of read that. But I mean, probably teenage years would be the, the ideal. And I think it puts a completely different perspective on what is really taught within normal educational establishments at the moment. And, um, you know, that was a great book. I think the second book that I uh, got a lot from was uh, The Values Factor, uh, Dr. John Demartini. And what it does is basically tells you what your true true passions are. And actually, you know, you might think you have a particular passion or something, but this book really delves into it and really, you know, gets deep into your psyche and actually establishes exactly what it is that makes you tick. And um, it's really on the basis that, you know, if you're doing something that you're passionate about, then it's no longer work. That You know, you would do it whether you were getting paid or not getting paid. So... Uh, and, and, and I find that's 100% true because self-build is my passion. I love it. And, and yes, obviously, I want to try and get some income from it and, and, and benefit from my, you know, 40 odd years in, in the construction sector. But, um, I, you know, I just love it. I find it very inspiring. And the sense of satisfaction that you get when, I, you know, when I actually have self-built and the sense of satisfaction that I see in people who have self-built is just, it's immeasurable, George, to be honest. You know, it just... It just fills me, just gives me that fuel, you know? Yeah, 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 I can see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> another, another book I'm actually uh, just waiting from Amazon recently was recommended to me, but I think it would be a good, really good book is uh, The Miracle Morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to read that one, I think, because that just, you know, kind of gets you right into the right psyche when you get up in the morning and, and uh, you know, progress through the day in, in a very positive attitude, so. Definitely. Yeah, I'd probably say that's the books that's influenced me most. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Um, and what about, say, you know, in, in a habit, a belief, a behaviour, something that's um, impacted your life over the last five years that you've started doing and has really made a change? Made a change. I think, uh, I think it is, um, you know, to over, overcome any fear. I think to, to do something that you're uncomfortable with every day, uh, it build, you know, builds your character. 
Uh, and I've always been a believer of that, and it's something I've probably done subconsciously without actually really thinking about it. But um, when I was, you know, looked at, uh, there was a seminar I was involved with recently, and such, somebody came out and, and, and actually said that, you know, you should be doing something that you're uncomfortable with every day. And I hadn't really thought about it prior to that, George, to be honest. But when I actually looked back, I thought, well, I do push myself. I do try and do something every day that I'm maybe not comfortable doing. It's maybe making that awkward phone call. It's maybe asking something, some, somebody something, bit of information that you're maybe not 100% comfortable in asking. It could be, you know, relating to the self-build. It could be going knocking on the door because there's a piece of ground next to a house that you've seen. And it's just knocking on the door and saying, well, look, you know, is there any possibility of, you know, right. you selling that site? People say, oh, I really wouldn't like to do that. Well, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. The worst that can happen is that they say no. Mm. You've lost nothing from it. Mm. Uh, but if you leave your name and telephone number, situations can change fairly rapidly. And if they do change their mind and, and do start considering selling it, then they're probably going to give you a call. So it's just little things like that that, as I say, you should you know you should try and you know try and do whatever it is. It's never it's never life threatening, as I say. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, so you know, thinking thinking about your your childhood, um, you know, most people have something that influences their their passion. So what 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 kind of things happened to you as a as a youngster? Um, well, my uh, I suppose uh, one of the things was that I had to get pretty used to kind of moving from school to school because my father was a policeman. So uh, back in the day, they generally had to uh, move probably every three or four years. So I had to get used to, you know, having a new circle of friends, going to a new school. So that, you know, that certainly, you know, being a fairly shy you know, kind of child, that I think probably helped expand me. And I just had to get used to that because that was just the norm. But I, in terms of, I've often thought, well, what, what really got me interested in the construction side? And I think it really was because my, my best pal and my oldest pal, you know, went to primary school with him, my pal Willie. His father uh, had a joinery, joinery workshop, which as you can imagine as a young kid was a great attraction for us to go and play there because <laughs> there was all sorts of things you could get up to, a bit of mischief. And I always remember there was a big tub of, you know, the putty that it used to kind of, putty in the windows with yeah. in, in, in the old days. Well, it was great stuff to play with. And we used to kind of this great big barrels. We used to kind of play in that and, and uh, get ourselves in a right mess and up, upset my pal's dad. But I always remember that it was great to see the raw timber coming into the actual um, uh, workshop and then actually see what the craftsmen did because they were craftsmen. I mean, these guys were, you know, were making stairs, they were making sashing case windows. They were making doors, they were ma you know, anything you can think of that you could use uh, timber to build, they were actually doing it. So they were very much craftsmen. And just the smell and the buzz of it and the sawdust and the, the chippings, all the rest of it, it kind of sparked it. And I just become fascinated from that point on in terms of building. So, you know, I always remember when I was at school, when the career officer came around to say, well, what do you like to do? It was just, it was always something in building and it was actually going to be a building, a building inspector which in actual fact, later in my career, I actually ended up being a building inspector with the <laughs> local, you know, kind of local authority. So yeah. there was a wee bit of a kind of premonition there maybe, but, you know, there we go. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, that's always been my passion. And as I say, self, you know, self-build in particular. Mm, good. Um, so thinking about self-build now, um, I know there are a number of financial benefits, incentives for doing self-build like VAT. Can you talk us through yeah. those? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the major benefits you get in self-build is you don't have to pay VAT, which you know obviously is currently you know currently twenty percent. Now, dependent how you go about the build, if you're uh, using a building contractor, for example, the building contractor will invariably be VAT registered, so he will be invoicing you net of VAT. So your you know your invoices won't have any VAT added to them. If, however, you go down the project management route, whereby you project manage the build yourself, uh, which most self builders actually do. So they will engage different subcontractors, you know, you know maybe the, the builder, the plumber, the electrician, the joiner. And if they're, if they're not VAT registered, then they would, they, you know, would um, claim, claim VAT on their invoices. 
And similarly so, if you're actually buying materials to give to the contractors uh, for them to use, then you'll be paying VAT, you know, assuming you're not VAT registered, of course, then you're outlaying the VAT during the, the, the actual build. But what you do is at the end of the, the project, once you've got your completion certificate or habitation certificate, you then claim back the VAT from HMRC. Uh, and they would generally will refund the, you know, the money pretty quickly. Now, it's very rare in these days to get anything back from HMRC. It tends to be a pretty one-way street, George, as I'm sure you'll agree. But this is one of, one of the occasions when you can't actually get money back from, from, HR, from HMRC, which is Yahoo. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's one of the major benefits you've got. Another benefit you've got is in terms of uh, stamp duty. Uh, because you're only paying stamp duty on the price of the plot rather than the completed house. Mm. Now, given that uh, uh, very recently uh, Boris has uh, increased the stamp duty threshold um, uh, and, well, and throughout the country, actually, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So you can buy a plot in England and Northern Ireland up to £500,000 and not have to pay any stamp duty. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to Scotland and Wales, because the house prices in Scotland and Wales tend to be less than what they are in England, so the threshold there is 250,000. So you wouldn't be paying any stamp duty if you're buying a plot up to 50, up, up to 250,000 pounds. So that's again is a big, big advantage. Right. Another major advantage you get in building your own home, of course, is that you can design the house exactly to suit your your requirements. You know, what your family requirements are and the, the, the internal layout of the house to suit you know your lifestyle so you've got complete flexibility for that obviously subject to what planning will allow you to build yeah. there's always that caveat that sometimes the planners can be a bit a bit stuffy in terms of what design you can build yeah but uh, again you've got a lot more flexibility than you have in buying a standard house from one of the major house builders right and um, so um, not having to pay the VAT, that would, that would also apply if you decided to build like a housing estate. So if it wasn't something for yourself, but just building on a plot. Yeah, if you were doing it, the same applies if you're, if, you're, if you're moving from kind of self-build on to maybe doing a few builds, becoming a developer, then the same, same applies. But given that situation, given that your turnover would be in excess of the, the, you know, the VAT limit, you know, I went to a trading situation, then you would have to register, you know, you'd have to register for VAT and then you'd be claiming VAT through your normal VAT returns, be that monthly or quarterly, whatever. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, so you've built, you built two homes yourself. Um, yes, I have. And I was just wondering if you could talk me through them. So if we start with Laird Gardens, your first one. Okay, Laird Gardens, the first one. Um, well, that was in, in, in Aberdeen, 20 Laird Gardens in, in, in Aberdeen. Uh, purchased the plot in 1990, built it in 1991. And there'll be a bit of a story to that one, George, actually, because um, I passed this piece of ground and always thought, that's an ideal piece of ground for, you know, for building a house in. I've been looking for a piece of ground for a while. Contacted the local, I found out who owned it. It was a local uh, house builder. So I contacted the local managing director and said, look, you've got this piece of ground that's been lying there doing nothing for quite a few years now, I'd be interested in buying it. I'm looking to build my own house. The guy said, no, we're not going to sell it. We'll eventually develop it ourselves. So I thought, oh, well, but being a kind of tenacious type of guy and kind of to the earlier, the earlier point we made, you know, you know, what, what is there to lose? I thought, so I found out who the chief executive officer was of the, of the farm. He was based in Edinburgh, I remember. So uh, got through to him um, and had a word and said, look, I've made inquiries to your local office. They've been told this piece of ground's not for sale, but really it's been sitting there for years. And the size of operation you are, it's too small a piece of ground for you to develop economically. Why, would, you know, why won't you sell it to me? So he said, well, leave it with me. And the following day, I got a phone call back. He said, yeah, we're interested in selling a piece of ground. So I said, oh, great, that's fantastic. He said, but there's one condition and I said, Oh, what's that? He said, I'm not going to sell you one plot. He says, I want to sell you all you know, all the ground that's available there. And that was for four plots. Mm. So all of a sudden I'm thinking, Oh my God. Now had I known then what I know now, I would have bought the four plots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, you know, to say 
every day is a school day. I, you know, I didn't have that kind of awareness at the time. Uh, so what I then did was rushed about, and got three other people involved, and collectively we bought the four plots. I said to them, look, this is a piece of ground. That's my plot. You can argue among yourselves for the other three plots, which they did, and they all agreed. So we then, we then purchased, you know, purchased the plot. There was a wee uh, kind of squeeze, if you like, at the end, because what happened was the guy said, right, okay, yeah, we agreed a deal. And he said, there's one, one other condition. I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> and uh, But the other condition was that we had to settle within a very quick time scale. He was wanting to be sold before the year end. So we literally had, uh, I think it was two or three weeks to get the money uh, organized and actually get it get it paid to them, which we managed to do. We had one little blip with one of the one of the prospective owners. He was struggling to get a, a, a mortgage approved, but we managed to get that sorted out right. through a cluster friend of mine. So it all went hunky dory. That's good. So it's, so it's a house that was um, 210 square meters. And uh, it's actually a house that my son now lives in with my, uh, you know, with my family. Yeah. On the left hand side, that was 1991 with my three kids there. On the right hand side, that's taken from exactly the same position 29 years later. There's my three kids for, who are now adults. And uh, my youngest son, Martin, in the middle there, and my two grandsons in the, in the forefront. Uh, and that's a house that my son stays in, you know, stays into this day. So it was, you know, it was great from the point of view of it really creates that legacy. Mm. But when I built that house, day one, when we got it valued, uh, it was actually it was £50,000 of equity in it day one, which, you know, was fantastic. £50,000 then, you can imagine how much that would be worth now. So, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's going to give me quite a number of steps up the property ladder because prior to that, I was staying in a, a three-bedroom semi. So I jumped from a three-bedroom semi to a, to a you know big two hundred and ten square meter house with yeah. double garage and all the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, so that was a good move. Yeah, <laughs> a good move. Cool. So tell me about your second one, Cherry Cherry Cottage. Cherry Cottage. Well, that was uh, built on a piece of land that was owned by uh, my mother-in-law. She'd always had an aspiration to build a house on it. Uh, so we said, right, well, okay, let's do it. Let's build off you know a, a holiday home across there. So again, <clears throat> we. Um, I did it slightly differently this time because in the first one I did a lot of the work myself, so that was a big lesson learned. I wasn't going to do that again <laughs> uh, because I'm not a tradesman. Uh, it took me a lot longer and there was a lot more stress involved, believe me. So I'm the second you. time, what's the, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can relate to that if you're you know if you've done any DIY yourself, George. You know how stressful it can be. Yeah. Uh, but you can imagine what like it is when you're building a completely new house. So on the second one, I thought completely hands off. So I acted as project manager and engaged the various local tradesmen to do all the various trades. Um, and we built that three bedroom uh, uh, bungalow, which has fantastic views over the, you know, the rolling hills in Donegal and Republic of Ireland. And it's a home, it's uh, still in the family at this day, it's still used as a holiday home um, by the family. Uh, so yeah, that was, you know, that was the second one. Brilliant. Brilliant. We've, we've never actually had it. We never actually had it valued, but it would probably be worth at least twice what we actually paid for it. Yeah. Bearing in mind that we didn't have to pay anything for the plot. Yeah. Um, so again, from an investment point of view, um, you know, very good financially. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Um, so I've got some questions from the subscribers on my mailing list. Uh, okay. No awkward ones, I hope, George. Hope they're yeah. all nice well, and neat good ones. <laughs> <laughs> You might recognise some of the names. Um, so the first <laughs> one is from the multi-millionaire and entrepreneur, Jonathan Burliand, who I interviewed oh, yes. on the show, um, recently. So if you haven't seen it, watch his interview, How to Invest Now. Um, so his question for you, Mike, is what is the best way to find a plot of land to build on and is there a specific place to go and look for this? Okay. Um, well, I think what you should do for a start is if you're if you're based in England, you're looking in England, then you should register to the right you know, right right to build portal. And by that I mean, if you're wanting to build with any particular council area, what to do is uh, go onto their uh, you know their website and register that you're interested in self self building. Because uh, that was a requirement, uh, uh, gov government initiative that long last they recognised that self build had a big part to play in the chronic housing shortage we currently have in the UK. Uh, so they were looking at how, you know, how they could encourage more cell builds. 
self uh, build legislation came in in April 2016. So if you register on that, the council then have an obligation to uh, give planning permission for houses in order to satisfy the numbers that are on that on that uh, register. And they've got three years to do that from the October in 2016. So within three years, they have to have enough planning permission for self builders. Now that might be. That's not necessarily mean that the council will have to supply the plots themselves, but it means that if uh, the big developers are actually, you know, applying for say 200 houses in a development, then they can make it conditional in planning that they set aside a certain number, could be five percent, ten percent, whatever of that number, that are suitable for self, you know, for self builders. Mm. So that would be point number, you know, point number one would make before you do anything else, get yourself registered on that. In terms of finding a plot, well, I think on my course, I think I have something like 25 different ways of, you know, how you can improve your chances of finding a plot because getting a plot is generally the biggest hurdle for people to, you know, to, to jump. But I'm a firm believer in um, what I call the three foot rule. And that is, you know, people say, what, what the hell is the three foot rule? Well, tell everybody within three foot of you that you're actually looking for a plot. And it's basically what you and I would know as networking, George. The more people that are aware you're looking for something, the more chance you have of someone coming back and suggesting, look, I know there's a plot there, it'd be worthwhile looking at that. So networking is very, very important. You can not register for, there are various uh, online uh, uh, portals where you can actually register for, again, for a plot within the particular area you're looking to build in, and they will flag up to you as and when a plot is actually entered onto their register. So a couple of these would be www.plotsearch.com, www.plotbrowser.com. Another one is www.plotfinder.net. Okay. All right, I'll include some links for that so people can just click on it. Okay, so the next question is from Aaron Hampton, who, who you know as, as well. Um, Aaron, yes, I have. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Um, so his question is how to select a good plot, so your choice of plot, and is, pl is, it, is it worth um, buy buying a plot with planning permission or not? And how do you get permission if you just have a plot of land? Okay, well, I think what I would say for a start is that uh, I would be never, never buying a plot without planning permission unless you are conditioning your offer that, it, that you will buy it subject to getting planning permission. Now you can't, you can certainly, you know, because if, if you don't do that, you're basically gambling. Yeah. Gambling against whether you're going to get planning permission or not. And, uh, you know, gambling is really not where you want to, it's not something you want to be, you know, you, you want to be doing. But I mean, if you're in a situation where you think a plot has real potential and you've approached a local authority and they're saying, yeah, on the face of it, it looks pretty good. You can do a pre-planning application. Uh, in order to find out if the council are likely to approve it, but bearing in mind that a pre pre planning application is not uh, is, is not binding, it's not actually as if you've got permission. It's just a, a kind of comment, a snapshot at that particular time. So again, I'd always be at least it would give you a bit of, a bit of confidence that you're likely to get planning permission. But I would still always condition any offer for a site that doesn't have planning permission on planning permission being granted. Right. Um, as I say, otherwise you're gambling. If you're actually uh, buying a plot with planning permission, then you really need to be looking at what does the planning permission actually involve? Was it an outline planning permission? So just establishing the principle of development on the site, which then gives you a bit, a bit of flexibility in terms of what design the house you can, you, you know, you can put on the site, bearing in mind what the, the local architecture is. So if you're buying a, on a, a plot on a street, it's all bungalows, and you want to put up a three-story house, then obviously you're probably going to struggle. If you're happy with a bungalow, fine. Another thing you need to look at, if it was a detailed planning application with actually a house type approved, then you'd be need, you need to be looking at what the conditions were on the planning, because it could be that planning maybe had fairly onerous conditions, and maybe the onerous conditions are something that you're not, you know, you're not happy with. So again, you need to be looking at what the conditions that have been imposed on the planning, you know, on the planning approval before you would actually purchase it to make sure you can satisfy the conditions. Okay. And if, um, you know, if you find some, a, a, 
a plot which ha which has planning you know planning permission on it and yeah. um, it's not quite to your liking how easy is it to reapply again and change it yeah it's perfectly possible if if you you know if there's a plot and it's got a house on the house style on it and you think well that's not really what i want to build the layout doesn't suit you or the size doesn't suit you then yeah certainly you can re you can reapply for planner permission um now again the risk there is will you get to build what you want to build and that's again where you should be consulting with the you know the local planning officer and actually get a feel for it um and again then you have a, a, a decision to make well yeah based on what the planning officer says i'm pretty confident i'm going to get permission to build the house that i actually want but again there's always an element of risk and toss it's time as you have actually formally applied for that house and formally got approval for that house and have satisfied yourself that the conditions have imposed that you can deliver then there's an element you know there's an element of gamble that you want to ideally be de-risking it as, as much as you possibly can mm. you don't want to be buying a plot with a house type on it on the assumption that you're going to get permission for the house that you actually want to build because yeah. you know the old, you know, that can make a nasty view in me is the old, you know, old expression and that. So again, it's down, it's down to de-risking it as much as is possible. Yeah, but the old, the old one that was approved will still be approved if you're. You yeah, approved. it's still approved. Yeah, because the planning, mm. planning permission doesn't lie with you as an individual. Planning permission lies with the site. So you could get the one site that has three different planning, per, you know, planning permissions, as long as they're all within time scale. You could select either either of that three planning uh, planning permissions to actually progress with. So one might be for a four bedroom bungalow. One might be for a one and a half story five you know five bedroom house. One might be for a a two story five or six bedroom house. So right. if they've all got permission, then you can build any any one of these. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's still you know the permission is still valid. And how, how long do you have? Otherwise. So so if you've if you've received planning, you know, planning permission to, to develop this house, how long yeah. do you have to actually, you know, start digging a hole in the ground? Um, so if you're doing multiple applications, how long could you mess around for? Well, you can, you, you can mess up, you know, you can mess around for up to five years. Uh, but actually, once you actually substantially start, i.e. by that, I mean, you know, that could be, you know, scraping the ground, putting in the foundations, then that's a substantial start. So then the planning, the planning then runs on ad infinitum. So it's, You've, you know you've commenced the project yeah. uh, so that's you know that's not an issue for that it's a different situation maybe if you're looking at building regulation approvals because that generally lasts for three years right so you just have to be because you need the two permissions not just planning permission you generally need building regulation approval as well and the time scales for that for typical government rather than have them aligned they have them you know kind of different you know different time scales yeah but the yeah. difference between planning and building building regulations is when you apply for building regulations, if, it, if your drawings comply with building regulations, they have to approve it. It's not a case of, it's not a subjective thing of, you know, right. to comply with planning things, which tend to kind of move the policies change. Yeah. Building regulations are generally, you know, very specific. So as long as you comply with building regulations, then you're fine. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions on finance coming up. So what is the current market like for lending on self-builds? And what kind of finance do you need to apply for and what sort of size deposit? Self-build is a, a, is a kind of a bit more specialist than just your normal mortgage situation. So but there are you know, a number of specialist uh, brokers that actually deal with the self-build. And what you will find is that if you go to you know, high street banks and build societies, they'll, they'll say, oh, yes, you know, we deal with self-build. We've got you know, an officer that deals with self-build. The reality is, in my experience, they really they don't really understand self-build. You know, they're just trying to kind of capture some of that some of that marketplace, but they, they, they don't really understand it. They're just looking at residential mortgages. So you're far better getting involved with brokers that actually do deal with self-build mortgages on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a company called Build Store who actually specialise in that marketplace. They they, they in the UK buy more self-build mortgages than anyone else, so they, they would certainly be worth www.buildstore.co.uk. In terms of borrowing, you're probably talking that can be anywhere from 75 to 95 percent, depending on your financial situation. They would generally have to look at what your financial situation, look at what assets you have, 
look at what liabilities you have, look at what savings you have, and then they will be able to uh, pick a product that best suits your particular situation. Mm. But that can be a product where it actually allows you to, you know, to buy the plot and then or staged payments, which can either be um, in advance or in arrears. Now, by an advance, I mean that they will actually give you payment. Say we're talking to get the building up to foundations, up to underbuilding, up to DPC level, then they can uh, organize funding. So they give you that money in order that you can fund that build. So they're giving you the money in advance, stage payment in advance. Or alternatively, it's an arrears. So if you can fund that yourself, then they will actually then give you a, a stage payment when you're up at DPC level and you're funding it yourself. So there's two different ways of doing it. As I say, advanced payments or, you know, the more normal that you would normally get would be um, once you've actually done the work, then you get, you know, kind of then you get paid. So again, depends on individual situation, but, uh, you know, perfectly possible to get the uh, uh, mortgages for self-build. A lot of people think it's not, but that's a nonsense. Perfect. That answers my second question. Was there a way to fund the plot up to damp proof course? And he, he said yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Let's say, again, depending on your financial situation, but yes, you know, you can certainly, you know, can certainly achieve that. And that means that, you know, it's, it's a positive cash flow situation because a lot of people think, well, okay, I've got a mortgage and that's fine. I can fund it. But the, the important thing is getting access to the funds at the right time because your builder will require stage payments. If you're buying a timber frame kit, for example, they'll want it to be paid up front before it leaves the factory. So really cash flow is absolutely key. And again, in my course, I kind of point out that, that, you know, fine getting a mortgage, but it's how you cash flow the whole thing. So that's really more important in, you know, in, in terms of um, how you're going to do that rather than what mortgage is available to you, because it's important you know when the funds are available to you. And if you can get on a staged payment basis, then great, you're home and dry. Do you think it's better to buy the plot in cash and then finance? Um, yeah, so if you question from Niran on that. Yeah, certainly you can do that because then obviously you've got an asset, so you can borrow against that asset. So that would, you know, you know, that would certainly uh, give you more uh, more choice in terms of what mortgages are available to you, most definitely. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so, question from Imran. Um, so, if you saw um, a, a four bedroom house. Um, for sale, let's say £220,000, um, what percentage of the selling price would have been required to build it? Okay, well, if you're looking at your, your major house builders, um, then generally, uh, in general terms, every third, fourth house is what their profit is. So, you know, if you look at it from that point of view, you know, 25 to kind of 30% in rough terms is what, you know, what profit they're actually making. So the benefit, I mean, the average self-builder actually saves 29%, would you believe? So that then gives you the opportunity, then gives you two choices. It means you could build the same size of house that you would be buying from one of the major major house builders, but you're going to have a, a reduced mortgage because um, it's going to cost you 29% less. So your, your outgoings in terms of your mortgage is going to be 29% less, if you like. Um, so that's going to give you more disposable income. So maybe allows you to go more holidays per year or whatever other passion you actually have. Well, I'm more property. <laughs> more, more property, exactly. And, you know, invest in assets rather than that's something it. that, say, uh, you know, you spend once and that's it. You get pleasure of it once. But no, 100% right, George. And, uh, yeah, you know, some of your books actually explain that in a lot of detail. Yeah. Um, and I particularly liked, you know, I particularly liked your book, you know, Retire Now. So that was a great one. That Thanks, people Mark. should certainly, no, you should certainly look at that because it's uh, some fantastic tips in there as to how you should be reducing, you know, what your costs are and and uh, spending your money on assets rather than liabilities. Mm. Um, but getting back to the question, sorry, can I wee bit dig and digress there, George? But um, yeah, getting back to the question was, yeah, so every third, fourth house is their profit. Uh, and so as I say, you could build a bigger house for the same, you know, for the same money. Uh, so just as a, you know, as an example, a 200 square meter house. If you're if you're uh, going to build 29% uh, bigger than that, then that equates to two fairly fairly big rooms. That's to a couple of rooms that are maybe like 4.5 by 4.2 meters, which is 15 feet by 14 feet roughly for those that are still working in Imperial. So that could mean that gives you at least an, you know, an, 
additional couple of bedrooms or a bedroom and a, a you know and a family room. So and the big thing you get is that you're building the house that suits your you know your lifestyle to suit what your particular requirements are. Um, and that's you know you know that's a biggie because again when you're kind of tied by the major house builders, they're always supplying stand stand up house types. You know some people are happy with that. But I think there's nothing better than the opportunity to design your own unique style of house yeah. to suit your exact, you know, kind of living living requirement for now. And you can also build in what you you know what you would like to do in the future, particularly if it's a young couple, maybe can't afford all you know to build it all at the moment, but they could afford to put in say in a bungalow, attic trusses, what they call a dormer bungalow, that they could develop upstairs into bedrooms as and when the family comes along. So right. you can do all that type of thing, a lot more, a lot more flex, flexibility. Right. Okay. So what advice would you give to someone who's considering self-build for the first time? I think the advice I would, you know, would give is to, it's like most things in life, you can go into anything, you know, uneducated and available, it's going to cost you, going to cost you money. One of the benefits of the, probably everybody's seen, you know, the Grand Designs Programme, which I think is a great, great inspirational uh, great inspiration for people, you know, to you know to self-build. However, in, invariably, there's always some kind of disaster, <laughs> and uh, I, I really look at the screen uh, and think, oh, you know, school schoolboy errors. In, in many occasions, and really, you know, had they been educated, they would not get themselves into that situation. So it's been good from a inspirational point of view, but it probably has some, you know, put some people off now. Self-building, you know, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not, but it is easy if you know what you're doing and what steps you should take and in what order you should take them in order to uh, successfully, successfully self-build. So, you know, my course, I go through that right from day one, what the benefits of self-build are, right through the whole process in terms of how you find a plot, how you value a plot, uh, what build method you should use, right through to the, the VAT recall claim at the end of the day if you're doing it on a self, self-managed self basis. So I'm really holding your hand through the whole process so there should be no surprises. Um, and, uh, and you also go and visit the plot, is that right? You could, yeah, yeah, it should definitely, what, sorry, in terms of should I, when I will actually, yes. you know, if, if people sign up to the course, it would be my intention to visit everybody, everybody who signs up to the course to go and actually visit their plot at least once during the actual build. That would be because I would, you know, love to see the kind of progress of that and actually video people and say, well, okay, you know, what did you feel? What advantages did you have from the course? And um, um, where did it save you both time and money? And from my point of view, if I can't save you the price of the course many times over, then I would feel as if I've done you a disservice. Mm -hmm. Because one, one little mistake in the whole process you know, you'll spend a hell of a lot more than what the price of the course is. So, right. you know, that would be money well spent. Absolutely. Right. So maybe, maybe if you can give me an example of the worst thing that could happen if you if you get this one thing wrong, it will cost you tens of thousands of pounds. Well, the, the one thing that, that that could cost you a hell of a lot of money is if you don't. For example, a lot of people say if you're in a situation where you're cash rich and you say, "I'm going to build this house," and um, I don't require any mortgage. Fine, yes, you can certainly do that. But uh, what I would generally suggest is you should always get a warranty. Even though you're in a fortunate situation that you don't actually require a mortgage because all mortgage companies will require a warranty. And by that, I mean, you probably everybody's probably heard, heard of the NHBC warranty that a lot of the major house builders give. In simple terms, that's a 10-year insurance back guarantee that if there's any inherent problem with the house within that first 10 years, then the building company have got to go back and put it right. Or if they're not uh, no longer in business, uh, then the NHBC will pay for a, another builder to actually come and put the fault, you know, the fault right. So again, back to your, if you're actually, you know, fortunate situation, not having a mortgage or not requiring a mortgage, that's fine, but if and when your life situation changes, and you know, God forbid, it could be something like illness, it could be something like you know, death, or it could be a change where you've maybe got a change of job, and you now have to move house. Then, if you're not, if you don't have this say ten-year warranty in place, then you're limiting your marketplace to 
a cash buyer. Now, invariably, if you're limiting your marketplace to a cash buyer, then invariably that's going to mean that you're not going to maximise what the value of the house actually is. And that could amount to tens of thousands of pounds. Mm -hmm. So that one simple thing, and I've come upon it time and time again, where people have built the house, they've maybe overspent, so they're now going for a mortgage, they don't have a warranty in place, uh -uh, big problem. They then have to try and get a, a warranty company to come on uh, retrospectively. So retrospectively means that they will say, right, I want you to dig out uh, excavations to show me that the foundations are right. I want you to rip off that plasterboard to show me that you have insulation in there. I want you to do X, Y, and Z. So very destructive, invasive investigations in order to satisfy them that what you've built is indeed built to comply with regulations and is right. So again, you could be talking about many, many thousands of pounds in that situation. Wow. I've been there, I've seen it, and it's not an area you want to go. No, no. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, being being on these expert panels and just talking to people in general about self-build, you must have overheard some really bad recommendations that are just totally wrong. Um, can you give me an example of one that's your pet hate? Yeah, I suppose my pet hate is when they say a third, a third, a third. And we've all heard that, you know, a third for a plot, a third, you know, can a third to build, and a third is what you're left with. Now, you know, that can, I'm not saying that, you know, that can't, that equation can't work, but the reality is, depending where you are in the country, that won't help. So if you're in South England, for example, where the cost of a plot is very high, uh, then, you know, that, that third, third, third figure will never actually work. So, I, you know, that's one of my pet hates. I never say that. And that's, that the next one would be, oh, well, you know, how much is it going to cost per square meter? And people will throw out uh, figures willy-nilly. And I say, well, no, I, you know, I can't tell you until you give me a bit more information. So, you know, you've heard the expression that the quality of the question will give you the quality of the answer. So I would say, well, no, and people say, well, but, you know, you're a self build expert. You must be able to tell me that. And I said, well, no. I said, can I give you an analogy? You've gone into the, the local car showroom, the Ford car showroom, and you said, I want to buy a car. And they say, well, okay, uh, that's fine. You want to buy a car? Well, you know, I don't know at that point in time what size of car you, you, you want to build. I don't know the specification of the car you want. Um, and even if we just look at one particular car type, the Mondeo, Ford Mondeo, say, for example, well, is it the L, the GL, the GLX, or the sporty one with all the bells and whistles? The price difference is going to be fairly substantial. Well, it applies exactly the same when you come to a house. Is it, you know, is it a straightforward bungalow? Is it a house that has, you know, a very complicated roof? Has it got lots of uh, uh, glass and windows and doors, glazed gables? What's the spe specification internally? Is it painted quality doors or is it oak finish? Has it got oak stair? How much do you want to spend in your kitchen? Is it a Howden's kitchen or is it one from one of the high spec kind of you know kitchen companies? Because that in itself can make a huge difference in terms of your square meter rate. Bathroom fittings, is it the standard B and Q bathroom fittings or is it the all singing dancing um, uh, shower shower cabinet with the uh, you know, sprays coming from you in all directions and, you know, maybe even a stereo within it. Yeah. Is it a bath with a jacuzzi? Is it gold taps? So it's all down to specification. Mm. Okay. So generally, I would be asking, you know, a bit more information in order to establish what the specification was and then be able to give you a more accurate answer to the question in terms of what the square meter rate is. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, now, you must, if you, as you've helped thousands of people to build their own homes, you must have seen some things that have gone wrong um so can you think of a you know one of your favorite failures and how how the problem was overcome yeah i suppose the favorite the favorite failure is just to go for the cheapest price all the time uh, uh and i always say to people it's not it's, don't, don't always go with the cheapest because at the end of the day it's you know it's not a race to the bottom you really have to be looking at when you're actually going out for uh, for prices, you should really be going out for uh, ideally at least three prices, and then you need to have need to be looking at that prices in detail. So you are comparing apples for apples. The amount of times that I've seen people actually go and kind of can relate this back to my timber frame days, we would price for a job uh, and then we'd be doing the follow up phone call. 
oh yeah, you, I've got a quote. Have you any queries? Yeah, sorry, we've placed our business elsewhere. Oh, sorry, what, you know, why didn't we get a chance to, uh, you know, to review our price and to have a chat with you? No, no, I, you know, I got a price that was 20% less. Now, right away, alarm bells are ringing in my head, and I'm saying, well, look, I really, you know, obviously it's too late. You know, the horse has bolted. I'd be interested in seeing what the specification is. Would you be prepared to send it in to me? Yes, certainly. So they would send in the specification. I would look through specification and I would see major differences. In fact, the amount of times I've looked through the specification where we had included for windows and external doors and the price they've accepted doesn't include for windows and doors. Now that could equate <laughs> that could equate to 25% of the kit value. Yeah. So they think they're getting a bargain, but the reality is they're not getting a bargain. They haven't compared it apples for apples. So what we used to say was, look, you know, give us an opportunity to look through our competitors' quotes. I'm not interested in what their price is. Their price is their price. All I want to do is be able to look at the specification, highlight what the differences in, are in the specification between ours and our competitors, and at least then you can make an informed decision. Hmm. So, I mean, if I've seen that, if I've seen that once, I've seen that a hundred times. Right. Right, so check carefully. <laughs> apples, apples for apples is absolutely key. Right. Okay. Um, so, can we come to my last last question? If you could have a gigantic billboard to send a message to the world, what would you write on it? Ooh, that's a good one, George. Let me think. Um, I think my favourite expression of mine is "Every day is a school day." It doesn't matter how how old you are. You should always look every day and always be prepared to learn learn something new every day. So I think that would be the point I would probably do. Every day is a school day. Uh, try and learn something different every day because that's going to expand you. And it's amazing, you know, over seven days in a week, even what you will know at the end of the week that you didn't know at the beginning of the week. You start putting that into months and years, and all of a sudden the information you've built up in this little bit of grey matter you've got in, in between the grey hairs, um, that's going to serve you well for the rest, you know, for the rest of your life. Definitely, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, I do the same thing every day. Every day, I'm, I'm learning something, doing a course, you know, reading a book or, or whatever. Always learning. Continue. Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent agree. Yeah. So, um, so thanks, thanks for coming on the show. If people want to follow you or um, check out your course, where where should they go? If they go to, uh, you know, the website is www.self-buildsuccess, all one word, .co.uk. You will see on there, we, you know, we have um, the free webinars are listed on there. You can register on there just by, you know, by clicking the green button. Uh, and then that will you know, open it up to uh, one of the webinars where I go into it in a bit more detail. We'll uh, go into detail in terms of what the course actually includes, when it's being run, etc. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'll put a I'll put a link in so they can just click on that it. Link and that'll be good, George. Thanks for that. No problem. Um, so thank you everyone for watching and listening. Um, please subscribe so you don't miss next week's episode. Um, so it's goodbye from Mike. Goodbye. Thanks for listening, everyone. I hope you've learned learned something today, and uh, hopefully look forward to seeing you on the Cell Build Success uh, website. Definitely, definitely. Check it out. I attended his webinar yesterday. It was great. <laughs> Thanks, George. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.